Section 29 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. All About Coffee by William Eukers. Preparing Green Coffee for Market. Part 1. La Roque, in his description of the ancient coffee culture, and the preparation methods as followed in Yemen, says that the berries were permitted to dry on the trees. When the outer covering began to shrivel, the trees were shaken, causing the fully matured fruits to drop upon cloths spread to receive them. They were next exposed to the sun on drying mats, after which they were husked by means of wooden or stone rollers the beans were given a further drying in the sun and then were submitted to a winnowing process for which large fans were used development of plantation machinery the primitive methods of the original arab planters were generally followed by the dutch pioneers and later by the french with slight modifications as the cultivation spread necessity for more effective methods of handling the ripened fruit mothered inventions that soon began to transform the whole aspect of the business Probably the first notable advance was in curing, when the West Indian process or wet method of cleaning the berries was evolved. About the time that Brazil began the active cultivation of coffee, William Panter was granted the first English patent on a mill for husking coffee. This was in 1775. James Henkel followed with an English patent granted in 1806 on a coffee dryer, an invention communicated to him by a certain foreigner. The first American to enter the list was Nathan Reed of Belfast, Maine, who in 1822 was granted a United States patent on a coffee huller roswell abbey obtained a united states patent on a huller in eighteen twenty five and zenos bronson of jasper county georgia obtained one on another huller in eighteen twenty nine in the next few years many others followed john chester lyman in eighteen thirty four was granted an english patent on a coffee huller employing circular wooden discs fitted with wire teeth isaac adams and thomas ditson of boston brought out improved hullers in eighteen thirty five and james maycock of kingston jamaica patented in england in eighteen forty five a self-contained machine for pulping dressing and sorting coffee william mckinnon began in eighteen forty the manufacture of coffee plantation machinery at the spring garden iron works founded by him in seventeen ninety eight in aberdeen scotland he died in eighteen seventy three but the business continues as william mckinnon and company limited about eighteen fifty john walker one of the pioneer english inventors of coffee plantation machinery brought out in ceylon his cylinder pulper for arabian coffee the pulping surface was made of copper and was pierced with a half-moon punch that raised the cut edges into half-circles the next twenty years witnessed some of the most notable advances in the development of machinery for plantation treatment and served to introduce the inventions of several men whose names will ever be associated with the industry john gordon and company began the manufacture in london of the line of plantation machinery still known around the world as gordon make in 1850, and John Gordon was granted an English patent on his improved coffee pulper in 1859. 
Robert Bowman Tennant obtained English, 1852, and United States, 1853, patents on a two-cylinder pulper. George L. Squire began the manufacture of plantation machinery in Buffalo, New York, in 1857. He was active in the business until 1893 and died in 1910. The George L. Squire Manufacturing Company still continues as one of the leading American manufacturers of coffee plantation machinery. Marcus Mason, an American mechanical engineer in San Jose, Costa Rica, invented, 1860, a coffee pulper and cleaner, which became the foundation stone of the extensive plantation machinery business of Marcus Mason and Company, established in 1873 at Worcester, Massachusetts. John Walker was granted, 1860, an English patent on a disc pulper in which the copper pulping surface was punched or knobbed by a blind punch that raised rows of oval knobs but did not pierce the sheet, and so left no sharp edges. During Ceylon's fifty years of coffee production, the Walker machines played an important part in the industry. They are still manufactured by Walker Sons and Company Limited of Colombo and are sold to other producing countries. Alexis van Gulpen began the manufacture of a green coffee grading machine at Emmerich, Germany, in 1860. Following Newell's United States patents of 1857 to 59, Sixteen other patents were issued on various types of coffee-cleaning machines, some designed for plantation use and some for treating the beans on arrival in the consuming countries. James Henry Thompson of Hoboken and John Lidgerwood were granted, in 1864, an English patent on a coffee-hulling machine. William Van Vleek Lidgerwood, American Chargé d'Affaires at Rio de Janeiro, was granted an English patent on a coffee hulling and cleaning machine in 1866. The name Lidgerwood has long been familiar to coffee planters. The Lidgerwood Manufacturing Company Limited has its headquarters in London, with factory in Glasgow. Branch offices are maintained at Rio de Janeiro, Campinas, and in other cities in coffee-growing countries. Probably the name most familiar to coffee men in connection with plantation methods is Guardiola. It first appears in the chronological record in 1872, when J. Guardiola of Chocola, Guatemala, was granted several United States patents on machines for pulping and drying coffee. Since then, Guardiola has come to mean a definite type of rotary drying machine that, after the original patent expired, was manufactured by practically all the leading makers of plantation machinery. Jose Guardiola obtained additional United States patents on coffee hullers in 1886. William Van Vleek Lidgerwood, Morristown, New Jersey, was granted an English patent on an improved coffee pulper in 1875. Several important cleaning and grading machinery patents were granted by the United States, 1876 to 1878, to Henry B. Stevens, who assigned them to the George L. Squire Manufacturing Company, Buffalo, New York. One of them was on a separator, in which the coffee beans were discharged from the hopper in a thin stream upon an endless carrier or apron, arranged at such an inclination that the round beans would roll by force of gravity down the apron while the flat beans would be carried to the top. C. F. Hargraves of Rio de Janeiro was granted an English patent on machinery for hulling, 
polishing and separating coffee in 1879. The first German patent on a coffee-drying apparatus was granted to Henry Schofield of Guatemala in 1880. In 1885, Ivaristo Conrado Engelberg of Piracicaba, Sao Paulo, Brazil, invented an improved coffee huller, which three years later was patented in the United States. The Engelberg Huller Company of Syracuse, New York, was organized the same year, 1888, to make and to sell Engelberg machines. Walker, Sons and Company Limited began in 1886 experimenting in Ceylon with a Liberian disc pulper that was not fully perfected until twelve years later. Another name that has since become almost as well known as Guardiola appears in the record in 1891. It is that of Okrasa. In that year, R. F. E. Okrasa of Antigua, Guatemala, was granted an English patent on a coffee pulper. Additional patents on washing, hulling, drying, and separating machines were issued to Mr. Okrasa in England and in the United States in 1900, 1908, 1911, 1912, and 1913. The Fried Krupp A.G. Grusen work, Magdeburg, Buchau, Germany, began the manufacture of coffee plantation machines about 1892. Among others, it builds coffee pulpers and hulling and polishing machines of the Anderson, Mexican, and Krull, Brazilian types. Additional United States patents were granted in 1895 to Marcus Mason, a signer to Marcus Mason and Company, New York, on machines for pulping and polishing coffee. Douglas Gordon assigned patents on a coffee pulper and a coffee dryer to Marcus Mason and Company in 1904-05. The names of Jules Smout, a Swiss, and Don Roberto Ocrasa of Guatemala are well known to coffee planters the world over because of their combined peeling and polishing machines. The Huntley Manufacturing Company, Silver Creek, New York, began in 1896 the manufacture of the Monitor line of coffee grading and cleaning machines. The Marvelous Coffee Package It is doubtful if in all nature there is a more cunningly devised food package than the fruit of the coffee tree. It seems as if good mother nature had said, this gift of heaven is too precious to put up in any ordinary parcel i shall design for it a casket worthy of its divine origin and the casket shall have an inner seal that shall safeguard it from enemies and that shall preserve its goodness for man until the day when transported over the deserts and across the seas it shall be broken open to be transmuted by the fires of friendship and made to yield up its aromatic nectar in the great drink of democracy to this end she caused to grow from the heart of the jasmine-like flower that first herald of its coming, a marvellous berry which, as it ripens, turns first from green to yellow, then to reddish, to deep crimson, and at last to a royal purple. The coffee fruit is very like a cherry, though somewhat elongated, and having in its upper end a small umbilicus but mark with what ingenuity the package has been constructed. The outer wrapping is a thin gossamer-like skin, which encloses a soft pulp, Swedish to the taste, but of a mucilaginous consistency. This pulp, in turn, is wrapped about the inner seal called the parchment because of its tough texture. The parchment encloses the magic bean in its last wrapping, a delicate silver-colored skin, not unlike fine-spun silk or the sheerest of tissue papers, 
and this last wrapping is so tenacious, so true to its guardianship function, that no amount of rough treatment can dislodge it altogether, for portions of it cling to the bean, even into the roasting and grinding processes. Coffee is said to be in the husk, or in the parchment, when the whole fruit is dried, and it is called hulled coffee when it has been deprived of its hull and peel. The matter forming the fruit, called the coffee berry, covers two thin, hard, oval seed vessels held together, one to the other by their flat sides. These seed vessels, when broken open, contain the raw coffee beans of commerce. They are usually of a roundish oval shape, convex on the outside flat inside marked longitudinally in the centre of the flat side with a deep incision and wrapped in the thin pellicle known as the silver skin when one of the two seeds aborts the remaining one acquires a greater size and fills the interior of the fruit which in that case of course has but one cellule this abortion is common in the Arabica variety, and produces a bean formerly called Graget coffee, but now more commonly known as pea berry or male berry. The various coverings of the coffee beans are almost always removed on the plantations in the producing countries properly to prepare the raw beans it is necessary to remove the four coverings the outer skin the sticky pulp the parchment or husk and the closely adhering silver skin there are two distinct methods of treating the coffee fruits or cherries one process the one that until recent years was in general use throughout the world and is still in many producing countries is known as the dry method the coffee prepared in this way is sometimes called the common ordinary or natural to distinguish it from the product that has been cleaned by the wet or washed method the wet method or as it is sometimes designated the west indian process w i p is practiced on all the large modern plantations that have a sufficient supply of water in the wet process the first step is called pulping the second is fermentation and washing the third is drying the fourth is hulling or peeling and the last sizing or grating in the dry process the first step is drying the second hulling and the last sizing or grating harvesting the coffee cherry ripens about six to seven months after the tree has flowered or blossomed and becomes a deep purplish crimson color it is then ready for picking the ripening season varies throughout the world according to climate and altitude in the state of sao paulo brazil the harvesting season lasts from may to september while in java where three crops are produced annually harvesting is almost a continuous process throughout the year in colombia the harvesting seasons are march and april and november and december in guatemala the crops are gathered from october through december in venezuela from november through march in mexico the coffee is harvested from november to january in haiti the harvest extends from november to march in arabia from september to march in abyssinia from september through november in uganda africa there are two main crops one ripening in march and the other in september and picking is carried on during practically every month except December and January. In India, the fruit is ready for harvesting from October to January. Picking The general practice throughout the world has been to hand-pick the fruit, although in some countries the cherries are allowed to become fully ripe on the trees and to fall to the ground. 
the introduction of the wet method of preparation indeed has made it largely unnecessary to hand pick crops and the tendency seems to be away from this practice on the larger plantations if the berries are gathered promptly after dropping the beans are not injured and the cost of harvesting is reduced the picking season is a busy time on a large plantation all hands join in the work men women and children for it must be rushed overripe berries shrink and dry up the pickers with baskets slung over their shoulders walk between the rows stripping the berries from the trees using ladders to reach the topmost branches and sometimes even taking immature fruit in their haste to expedite the work about thirty pounds is considered a fair day's work under good conditions as the baskets are filled they are emptied at a station in that particular unit of the plantation or in some cases directly into wagons that keep pace with the pickers the coffee is freed as much as possible of sticks leaves etc and is then conveyed to the preparation grounds a space of several acres is needed for the various preparation processes on the larger plantations the plant including concrete surfaced drying grounds large fermentation tanks washing vats mills warehouses stables and even machine shops in mexico this place is known as the beneficio washed and unwashed coffee where water is plenty the ripe coffee cherries are fed by a stream of water into a pulping machine which breaks the outer skins permitting the pulpy matter enveloping the beans to be loosened and carried away in further washings it is this wet separation of the sticky pulp from the beans instead of allowing it to dry on them to be removed later with the parchment in the hauling operation that makes the distinction between washed and unwashed coffees where water is scarce the coffees are unwashed either method being well done does washing improve the strength and flavor opinions differ the soil altitude climatic influences and cultivation methods of a country give its coffee certain distinctive drinking qualities washing immensely improves the appearance of the bean it also reduces curing costs generally speaking washed coffees will always command a premium over coffees dried in the pulp whether coffee is washed or not, it has to be dried, and there is a kind of fermentation that goes on during washing and drying, about which coffee planters have differing ideas, just as tea planters differ over the curing of tea leaves. Careful scientific study is needed to determine how much, if any, effect this fermentation has on the ultimate cup value preparation by the dry method the dry method of preparing the berries is not only the older method but is considered by some operators as providing a distinct advantage over the wet process since berries of different degrees of ripeness can be handled at the same time however the success of this method is dependent largely on the continuance of clear warm weather over quite a length of time which cannot always be counted on in this process the berries are spread in a thin layer on open drying grounds or barbecues often having cement or brick surfaces the berries are turned over several times a day in order to permit the sun and wind thoroughly to dry all portions the sun drying process lasts about three weeks and after the first three days of this period the berries must be protected from dews and rains by covering them with tarpaulins or by raking them into heaps under cover if the berries are not spread out they heat and the silver skin sticks to the coffee bean 
and frequently discolors it. When thoroughly dry, the berries are stored, unless the husks, outer skin and inner parchment, are to be removed at once. Hot air, steam, and other artificial drying methods take the place of natural sun-drying on some plantations. In the dry method, the husks are removed either by hand, threshing and pounding in a mortar on the smaller plantations, or by specially constructed machinery known as hulling machines. THE WET METHOD PULPING the wet method of preparation is the more modern form, and is generally practiced on the larger plantations that have a sufficient supply of water, and enough money to install the quite extensive amount of machinery and equipment required. It is generally considered that washing results in a better grade of bean. In this method, the cherries are sometimes thrown into tanks full of water to soak about twenty-four hours, so as to soften the outer skins and underlying pulp to a condition that will make them easily removable by the pulping machine, the idea being to rub away the pulp by friction without crushing the beans. On the larger plantations, however, the coffee cherries are dumped into large concrete receiving tanks, from which they are carried the same day by streams of running water directly into the hoppers of the pulping machines. At least two score of different makes of pulping machines are in use in the various coffee-growing countries. Pulpers are made in various sizes, from the small hand-operated machine to the large type driven by power, and in two general styles, cylinder and disc. The cylinder pulper, the latest style, suggesting a huge nutmeg grater, consists of a rotary cylinder surrounded with a copper or brass cover punched with bulbs. These bulbs differ in shape according to the species or variety of coffee to be treated, Arabica, Liberica, Robusta, Canifora, or what not. The cylinder rotates against a breast with pulping edges set at an angle. The pulping is effected by the rubbing action of the copper cover against the edges or ribs of the breast. The cherries are subjected to a rubbing and rolling motion, in the course of which the two parchment-covered beans contained in the majority of the cherries become loosened. The pulp itself is carried by the cover and is discharged through a pulp chute, while the pulped coffee is delivered through holes on the breast. Cylinder machines vary in capacity from 400 pounds, hand power, to 4,800 pounds, motive power, per hour. Some cylinder pulpers are double, being equipped with rotary screens or oscillating sieves that segregate the imperfectly pulped cherries so that they may be put through again. Pulpers are also equipped with attachments that automatically move the imperfectly pulped material over into a repassing machine for another rubbing. Others have attachments partially to crush the cherries before pulping. The breasts in cylinder machines are usually made with removable steel ribs but in brazil nicaragua and other countries where owing to the short season and scarcity of labor the planters have to pick simultaneously green ripe and overripe dry cherries rubber breasts are used the disc pulper, the earliest type, having been in use more than seventy years, is the style most generally used in the Dutch East Indies and in some parts of Mexico. The results are the same as those obtained with the cylindrical pulper. The disc machine is made with one, two, three, or four vertical iron discs, according to the capacity desired. 
the discs are covered on both sides with a copper plate of the same shape and punched with blind punches the pulping operation takes place between the rubbing action of the blind punches or bulbs on the copper plates and the lateral pulping bars fitted to the side cheeks as in the cylindrical pulper the distance between the surface of the bulbs and the pulping bar may be adjusted to allow of any clearance that may be required according to the variety of coffee to be treated disc pulpers vary in capacity from twelve hundred pounds to fourteen thousand pounds of ripe cherry coffee per hour they too are made in combinations employing cylindrical separators shaking sieves and repassing pulpers for completing the pulping of all unpulped or partially pulped cherries fermentation and washing the next step in the process consists in running the pulped cherries into cisterns or fermentation tanks filled with water for the purpose of removing such pulp as was not removed in the pulping machine the saccharine matter is loosened by fermentation in from twenty four to thirty two hours the mass is kept stirred up for a short time and in general practice the water is drawn off from above the light pulp floating at the top being removed at the same time the same tanks are often used for washing but a better practice is to have separate tanks some planters permit the pulped coffee to ferment in water this is called the wet fermentation process others drain off the water from the tanks and conduct the fermenting operation in a semi-dry state called the dry fermentation process the coffee bean when introduced into the fermentation tanks is enclosed in a parchment shell made slimy by its closely adhering saccharine coat after fermentation which not only loosens the remaining pulp but also softens the membranous covering the beans are given a final washing either in washing tanks or by being run through mechanical washers the type of washing machine generally used consists of a cylindrical tub having a vertical spindle fitted with a number of stirrers or arms which in rotating stir and lift up the parchment coffee in another type the cylinder is horizontal but the operation is similar drying the next step in preparation is drying the coffee which is still in the parchment but is now known as washed coffee is spread out thinly on a drying ground as in the dry method however if the weather is unsuitable or cannot be depended upon to remain fair for the necessary length of time there are machines which can be used to dry the coffee satisfactorily on some plantations the drying is started in the open and finished by machine the machines dry the coffee in twenty-four hours while ten days are required by the sun the object of the drying machine is to dry the parchment of the coffee so that it may be removed as readily as the skin on a peanut and this object is achieved in the most approved machines by keeping a hot current of air stirring through the beans one of the best liked types the guardiola resembles the cylinder of a coffee roasting machine it is made of perforated steel plates in cylinder form and is carried on a hollow shaft through which the hot air is circulated by a pressure fan the beans are rotated in the revolving cylinder and as the hot air strikes the wet coffee it creates a steam that passes out through the perforations of the cylinder within the cylinder are compartments equipped with winged plates or ribs that keep the coffee constantly stirred up to facilitate the drying process another favorite is the okrasa 
It is constructed on the principle just described, but differs in detail of construction from the guardiola, and is able to dry its contents a few hours quicker. Hot air, steam, and electric heat are all employed in the various makes of coffee dryers. A temperature from 65 degrees to 85 degrees centigrade is maintained during the drying process. When thoroughly dry, the parchment can be crumbled between the fingers, and the bean within is too hard to be dented by fingernail or teeth. Hulling, peeling, and polishing. The last step in the preparation process is called hulling or peeling, both words accurately describing the purpose of the operation. Some husking machines for hulling or peeling parchment coffee are polishers as well. This work may be done on the plantation or at the port of shipment just before the coffee is shipped abroad. Sometimes the coffee is exported in parchment and is cleaned in the country of consumption but practically all coffee entering the united states arrives without its parchment peeling machines more accurately called hullers work on the principle of rubbing the beans between a revolving inner cylinder and an outer covering of woven wire machines of this type vary in construction some have screw-like inner cylinders or turbines others having plain cone-shaped cores on which are knobs and ribs that rub the beans against one another and the outer shell practically all types have sieve or exhaust fan attachments which draw the loosened parchment and silver skin into one compartment while the cleaned beans pass into another Polishers of various makes are sometimes used just to remove the silver skin and to give the beans a special polish. Some countries demand a highly polished coffee, and to supply this demand the beans are sent through another huller having a phosphor bronze cylinder and cone. Much Guadalupe coffee is prepared in this way, and is known as Café Bonifeur, from the fact that the polishing machine is called in Guadalupe the Bonifeur Improver. It is also called Café de Lux. Coffee that has not received the extra polish is described as habitant, while coffee in the parchment is known as Café en Parché. Extra polished coffee is much in demand in the London, Hamburg, and other European markets. A favorite machine for producing this kind of coffee is the Smout Combined Peeler and Polisher, the invention of Jules Smout, a Swiss. Don Roberto Ocrasa also has produced a highly satisfactory combined peeler and polisher. For hulling dry cherry coffee, there are several excellent makes of machines. In one style, the hulling takes place between a rotating disc and the casing of the machine. In another, it takes place between a rotary drum covered with a steel plate punched with vertical bulbs and a chilled iron hulling plate with pyramidal teeth cast on the plate. Both are adjustable to different varieties of coffee. In still another type of machine, the hulling takes place between steel ribs on an internal cylinder and an adjustable knife or hulling blade in front of the machine. End of section 29